some of the rhetoric, even for people in Maryland, where we're kind of in this nether world between the East Coast, the Mid-Atlantic, and the South, where people sometimes speak very dismissively about what they call red states, which is only a very recent designation. It's only, it's only in the past 15 years or so that states that vote Republican have been designated as red states. There's no political science to it. It was a trick of, <laughs> it, was, it was a total editing choice that someone made and then it stuck. But one of the ways that people talk about it is they say things like, oh, I, just wish, I just wish we could just break off from them or they would break off from us or they're just a bunch of hicks or they're just a bunch of Trumpists or they're just a bunch of racists. Um, which is certainly true. There's plenty of racists in many of these places, and there's certainly many racists in power in those places, but that doesn't mean that that's the body of people in those places. And the body of people in those places are people who have been marginalized, who have been pushed down, and maybe are so marginalized, who feel so disaffected that they've become disengaged from the political process. But that doesn't mean they don't exist, and we can't overlook them, and we can't abandon them. And this talk tonight is going to tell us one of the reasons why is both politically dangerous and also missing the point if we say that we're going to abandon these, these states because these states are actually hotbeds of a new wave of organizing and labor struggle. So with that said, I want to give it up for Eric Blanc. Yeah, oh, actually... <laughs> We just want to have uh, Stephen make a real quick note about the DSA, and then we'll give it to Eric. Thanks, Colin. Um, yeah, so I'm Stephen from DSA. I'm the chair of the Labor Committee. We're really, really excited about this event. I think even though, obviously, there are a lot of very concerning things happening in the world today, uh, there's a lot of promise. You know, I think there are all these huge changes happening right in front of us, and uh, these strikes have been a huge part of that. So anyway, um, I just wanted to come up real quick and let you know about this sign-up sheet um, that we're passing out. Um, this is uh, really for the Be More Caucus, who we're uh, good friends with and who we love. Um, and so they're just organizing in the teachers' union, um, and uh, we just want to all get connected because we want to grow this movement uh, because we think we have the potential to, to really change the world. So. Um, if you're not a teacher, it's fine to sign in. We'd really like to be connected with everybody. So I'll just pass around the stack, and uh, if you could just give us your name and contact info, we'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Cool. Can you all hear me okay? How are you all doing? No, how are you all doing? We're going to get this going. Okay, that's good. This is an exciting talk. It's about something good. We don't always get to do talks about things that are good because there's not often... Uh, strike waves, and so, uh, or us winning, right, at all. Uh, so I'm here, bearer of good news, which is that for the first time in four decades, there is a strike wave in the United States, and I want to get you as, yeah, okay, I got, I, uh, Donna, is it, Donna is in fact, Donna is in fact a plant. I planted Donna there to clap, so when she starts clapping, you clap as well. Um, the purpose of tonight is really twofold. One is to get you as excited about the strike wave as possible and to understand, hopefully, the political implications. And then the second is to try to draw out some of the political lessons uh, we can learn for the organizing we're doing locally uh, where we're at. So with no further ado, I, I did used to be a teacher in uh, the Bay Area, so I'm going to subject you to some of my teacherly ways. And so for those of you who sat in back, you can, you know, reap what you sow now. Um, this is in lieu of a PowerPoint. So this is a graph which uh, you might be able to see, which shows the number of educators that struck uh, in past years. And you can see a dramatic increase in 2018, uh, almost 400,000 educators on strike, by far the largest in the history of the United States. Okay, graph number two. This is the average size of strikes. So again, this goes back to 1945, but it would look similar tracing it back earlier. This was by far the largest average size strike in the history of the United States with an uh, average size of almost 25,000 per strike. Does anyone know, do a little class participation, why uh, this, these strikes this last year were so big? There's, there's, there's a few different answers that are wrong and there's one right answer. So, so. Donna, you can't just get all the answers right. That's fine. Donna gets it again. Thank you. Yes, the strikes were statewide, um, which is to say that 
that's really new. Most of the strikes we have in the United States are very localized, um, and because the labor system keeps us as divided as possible. And so this broke from those confines, and you had its strike wave beginning in West Virginia, going to Oklahoma, Arizona, Colorado, North Carolina, Kentucky, and spreading. And then here's my last graph. Um, this is a graph of the total number of workers that struck. Um, in red, you can see the decline in manufacturing. It breaks it down by industry. And so you can see there in purple the uh, rise in education. And for some of you might be able to see in front, here in gray, um, it's the other workers that struck. And so uh, this is a question, and, and Donna, you cannot answer, uh, which is to what were the other, do, do people here know what the other two industries that struck other than education? Because there's an important similarity. What, what other industry struck in large numbers in 2018? Somebody said nurses. Nurses, that's, yeah, exactly. Healthcare, nurses specifically, one. And then the other? Hotels. 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 So you can think about the structural similarities between these three industries. I think the most important to highlight is that these are overwhelmingly female industries. And so you have a working class resistance right now being led by women workers, and we should just put that at the fore because it's a big part of why we're seeing the labor resurgence we're seeing. So um, the next slide slash laminate I have is to talk about the tr basically the political transformation that has happened in the United States because of these strikes. And the easiest way I could visualize this was uh, the way Time Magazine has changed its narrative, but it's really a stand-in for what the change in narrative of the country as a whole is, because for those of you who are teachers, how many people here are teachers to give us, get a sense of that? Okay. How many people are students? Yeah, they, give, give a round of applause to teachers in the room. There we go. Very good. Thank you. Yes. Um, so for, for those of you who are in or around the schools, you'll know that up until very recently, the dominant narrative about the crisis in schools was that uh, the reason the schools aren't what they should be, and I think we all agree that they aren't what they should be, is that teachers unions are obstructionist, that the private sector is more efficient than the public sector, so you have to... Boos, booing is good. Um, so yeah, so you have to bring in charters and privatization, and that basically teachers are greedy and the public sector workers are greedy. And that changed, but it took a while. And if you look here in 2014, uh, this is actually 2014, 2008. Does anyone know who this is in front? Uh, How to fix America's schools? Some of you should you should know this. This is not far from you. What's that? Michelle Ree. Michelle Who's Michelle Ree? Anybody? This is appropriate to his there. Yeah. Uh, Michelle Rhee, anybody? Former chancellor of D.C. Yeah, so Michelle Rhee's like privatizer and chief union buster in D.C., right? Uh, so when, when, I, when I made this reference last night, everybody hissed. So you, you got to bone up on your D.C. politics. Um, the second here, which is my favorite Time magazine cover ever, is Rotten Apples. It's nearly impossible to fire a bad teacher. Some tech millionaires may have found a way to change that. So... <laughs> A delightful article, highly worth reading. And that was the narrative until just this last year, in which this is the most recent time education cover, which is, I have a master's degree, oh, this is awkward. 16 years of experience, work two extra jobs, and donate blood plasma to pay the bills. I am a teacher in America. So the reason that you saw this transformation was not that the owners of time had a moral awakening overnight, of which they did not, but it's because the strike wave imposed a new common sense across the country uh, about really what is going on in the schools, and no longer was the old narrative, did, it didn't make sense, partly because the strikes captured the imagination of so many people, and they were so popular. According to the polls, you're talking about 78% of the population supported the teacher strikes and its demands nationally, right? And so the new narrative became, well, the reason that schools are not in the shape they uh, should be in is because A, they're not receiving the funds they need, and B, because you're not able to retain good teachers, um, particularly in the communities that need them most, which is disproportionately working class communities of color, because teachers are not getting living wages, right? And there's been union busing people and excessive testing that forces good teachers out. And that is the new common sense. We haven't won the policies yet, but we changed the narrative and it sets the basis for a lot more wins. And the wins that have happened already in this last year have been really dramatic. We're talking 20% pay raises in a place like uh, Arizona. We're talking about reversing privatization across the board, massively uh, refunding in certain schools. And that wouldn't have happened without the strikes. And I think the 
last big transformation that I would highlight is not just the political transformation in the broadest sense, but the, the personal transformation of people who participated in the strikes. Um, and I found that was the most moving aspects of the strikes, to be honest, which the people who had never been organizers before, who had, you know, like most working people in the country, just felt resigned to their fate, right? And, and, and trying to find individual solutions to what are actually collective problems. And the strikes for those folks they were almost at a loss of words to explain how powerful the experience was because when you're surrounded by tens of thousands of your coworkers and you feel that all of a sudden your voice is being heard, that's a transformative experience in which people had dis you know, difficulty describing it with anything other than like almost religious metaphors in which they came away feeling like new people about, they felt like their connection to their community and to their coworkers was just completely radically different. And that is a sense of power that is very hard uh, to, dissipate, you know, the Republicans and the Democrats will do their best to get that power uh, demoralized and to push people back into just feeling powerless, but the strikes have spread and they're continuing to spread, so much so that just the last anecdote on the, try to get you excited about the strikes, is do people remember how the federal government shutdown ended? So the federal government shutdown ended not because the Democrats did anything, um, but because <laughs> air traffic controllers uh, called in sick, and because the flight attendants union led by Sarah Nelson, who's a badass, uh, threatened to strike the next day. And when they asked Sarah Nelson, uh, how did you come up with this idea of striking? She said, well, if the teachers are doing it, why can't we, right? And so this idea, if the teachers are doing it, why can't we? I hope we're gonna continue to spread. So that's my, that, was, that was my pitch to get you as excited as possible about the strikes. And now I wanna try to briefly talk about what some of the lessons uh, for those of us who are organizers are. And I'll try to be relatively brief on these. The first I would say is that the strikes at their most successful highlighted um, demands not just for the teachers and you know educators, because these weren't just teacher strikes, they were strikes of all the school workers in the schools, but they weren't just strikes for the people who themselves were on strike, but they were strikes for really the working class as a whole and for working people generally. So this is what's called in the education movement, bargaining for the common good, in which you raise demands like in LA, for instance, uh, demand to end racial profiling of black and Muslim students in the schools, raise demands for anti-racist demands like in favor of an immigration defense fund for students whose parents were being faced with deportation, right? And it was these types of demands that were raised in addition to things like better pay that was able to cement uh, a unity between workers and the broader community that oftentimes doesn't exist within labor because unions are painted as being greedy and looking out just for themselves. And because the unions, in this case, really actively tried to break that down by building an alliance with the community, that's one of the reasons why they were so successful. The second big uh, lesson, I would say, is that they broke the law. And that's, that's actually kind of important because labor law in the United States is basically systematically set up so that we lose, right? It's very hard to organize unions in this country. It's very hard to organize strikes. In the vast majority of states in the country, public sector strikes are illegal. That's not actually a red state thing. I live in New York. Public sector strikes are illegal in New York. So this is a really across the board dynamic in which our most important weapon as workers, which is to withhold our labor, has been denied us, right? And because of that, workers had to break the law and they did that successfully. And the argument that was made by organizers was, if we all go out together, what are they gonna be able to do? Fire us all, right? And we shouldn't, uh, we, I think that we should really be cognizant. That was extremely scary. People did not strike um, recklessly because if your family depends on your wage to survive, you're not gonna very easily take a risk that could imperil all that. But ultimately, because of the movement was generated enough momentum that people took that risk and they won. And I think we're gonna have to take a lot more risks like that if we're gonna win. The third big lesson I would say is that it took a lot of organizing to make these strikes happen. And that's different than the way I think some of you who might have followed the media talked about it. The media framed it almost as if this were like these spontaneous explosions that came out of nowhere, right? Or that presumably it was just because things were bad enough in some of these states that folks rose up. But in fact, things have been very bad for educators and students for a very long time. So you can't actually explain why now just by conditions alone, because a lot of times people just are resigned to their conditions. And so it took organizers in all of these states to make people feel like something could be done to change those conditions. And in West Virginia, where the whole thing really started, um, at least in the recent iteration, the two people, Emily Comer and Jay O'Neill, who initiated the strikes, um, were 
first organized out of the Bernie Sanders campaign together and did a study group in the summer of 2017 of Jane McAlevey's book, uh, No Shortcuts, in their local DSA chapter. They joined DSA, so props to DSA, and for those of us, we can take some credit. Um, and they did a study group of this book uh, by Jane McAlevey, No Shortcuts, which is basically how you do deep organizing. And they successfully pushed their unions in that direction uh, from below, because the unions didn't want to actually strike or do anything other than just lobbying the Democrats. And it was these organizers on the ground spent months building up to the strikes and they made it happen. Uh, not just through kind of boring but important organizing like talking to your coworkers, but also things like wearing red on the same Friday and you know things like Facebook and memes. I was, to be honest, quite skeptical of social media and, and memes uh, as, as an organizing tool, but now I'm a firm believer in the power of memes. So uh, you know, it was useful and they were able to build up enough power to move in that direction. And ultimately, in places like LA, I think it was even more systematic because they had four years to build up for their strike. They shut that city down, and they think they showed us as organizers royal model of what it takes to win and how much work it takes. Because I think a lot of times people look for quick fixes, and there's no quick fix. Uh, and if you look at your workplace and you feel maybe demoralized because everyone's not ready to strike, nobody was ready to strike in any of these places at first either. It took a lot of work to make that case. And then the last big lesson I would say is the strikes at their most successful challenge this narrative that there's not enough to go around in this country, right? The scarcity narrative that there's just not enough funds for schools, there's just not enough funds for a clean environment, there's not enough funds to provide health care for all. And for education specifically, this was the main thing that we're always told. It's not normally actually the case that the Republicans or corporate Democrats say they hate education or teachers. They normally pretend they're with us, right? And every year we go and beg them for something. They say, well, come back next year. Hopefully we'll have the money for you, right? And what these strikes did is they said, no, we know this money exists. Here's where it is. It's the fact is that we would have more than enough to not only meet our demands, but provide a public education system for all students uh, that is quality and that is really the rights that they deserve, we could provide that if the corporations and the billionaires started paying their fair share. And that would only actually require reversing the tax cuts over the last 10, 15 years. It's not, you know, it's not a the socialist revolution, but it would be a big step forward, right? And it would require the billionaires to pay their fair share. And in LA and West Virginia, they put their fire straight on that small group of people that is responsible really for the collective problems that we have. And they were able to win a lot of folks who maybe even voted for Trump to this idea that actually they deserve more. And the reason that they don't have that yet is because a small group of people who own a lot of things have denied them their rights, but that we can take that back from them if we organize. And they did that extremely successfully. And I think for all of us, that's important because otherwise, if we don't raise the questions of like progressive taxation, making the rich pay, then even if educators win some demands, we're gonna start getting pitted against other workers, right? We're gonna, if this would just happen in Washington. Washington won pay raises, 20% pay raises, and then the Democrats, the next session, started cutting other public services, particularly in communities of color, and said, this is what happens. If, you, you know, if we give educators their raise, we're gonna have to cut it from somewhere. So unless we raise progressive taxation and raise really our fire on the people who deserve it, we're not gonna be able to build a united movement. So those are my four big lessons. Hopefully that some of that resonates and I'm really looking forward because we have the amazing teachers in Be More uh, coming up. We have a round of applause for our Be More <laughs> organizers <laughs> who are next. Uh, yeah, so for those of you who came in late, that is the structure. I'm about to end my spiel and then we have uh, these amazing comrades coming up to talk about their organizing. But I'll leave you with these final thoughts. Um, Think about the moment we're in. It's really a historic and very scary moment, but also an exciting moment. It's scary because of the rise of the right and Trump and climate change and all of that. Um, you know, it's it's a, in some ways and the threat of war with Iran, right? Like I, it was a, I had a dark day today. But that being said, um, we are also in this extremely opportune historic moment in which for the first time you have a strike wave in the United States. For the first time working class people are winning and fighting back. And when you have that combined with other factors that we haven't seen for generations, the rebirth of a socialist movement, DSA has 60,000 members. That's a big deal. And that they played a role and we played a role in the strike and we can continue to play that role if we continue to organize. And we have the possibility of electing a democratic socialist to the president of the United States, which is a really big deal. Yes. And it's not Elizabeth Warren, it's Bernie Sanders. Um, and the combination of these three factors, the strike wave, 
the rebirth of a socialist movement and then the Bernie moment means that we, for the first time in a very long time, can rebuild a mass working class movement in this country. And that is a huge responsibility. It's a huge opportunity. But if you look at Arizona and you look at Oklahoma, these conditions there were very hard to organize. And if they were able to organize successful mass strikes in places like that, I think it shows that working class people are looking for an alternative. And when we organize and provide that, folks will seize that and we can change the world. So I'll leave it at that. So we give a big round of applause for Natalia from Be More. We have, we have more people than chairs, but um, well, all right, we'll figure it out. We'll do musical chairs. Hi, I'm Natalia Backus, um, one of the founding members of Be More, Baltimore Movement of Rank and File Educators here in Baltimore City. And um, we're gonna take a couple minutes. There's five of us from five different school districts in Maryland. We're gonna tell you a little bit about what organizing work we're doing in our school districts and then how could we start a statewide movement such as in um, Eric's book where we need to go statewide. That's the next step. So I'm just gonna tell you a little bit. I met Eric um, in West Virginia last summer when we were in West Virginia and West Virginia was trying to form a statewide caucus. They had done a strike without even having a caucus formed. And then also in Los Angeles in January when we both went out there to help with the strike and they just put us to work. So like when you read Eric's book, like he's in there doing the work with the rank and file members and um, like he says in, in, your, in the book, like you just need to all come together and be part of it. And so he asked Be More to be part of this event. And when he called me, it was April, end of April, and he's like, I'm doing this book talk in May and uh, June. And I was like, all right, as long as it's past our election on May 15th. <laughs> we have this big election on May 15th, that's all we can think about. And we had the election on May 15th, and it still didn't end. Like, <laughs> it's not over, we don't know. We, we had an, an election, we won, then the incumbent said they want a re-election, the national AFT came down and did a hearing on June 10th, we still haven't heard, what are the findings and recommendations from the national union? So, thought it would be definitely know by this event what was going on, but, but no. <laughs> and so just to back up a bit, Be More started unofficially in 2015 and officially in 2017. And it's because we were inspired by other social justice teacher union caucuses around the United States. We saw what CORE in Chicago was doing, Union Power in LA. Um, there's a national umbrella called UCOR, United Caucuses of Rank and File Educators, and they help um, cities and school districts figure out how to form these caucuses. And when we saw what other places were doing, we were like, well, if they're doing it, why can't we? Let's try it. And there's a good article if you want to read more about the history of Be More. It's in The Nation by Rachel Cohen, and she kind of interviewed us to ask, like, how did we get started? And um, it was basically just three of us, uh, me, Christina, who's sitting over there, and um, Corey, who I'm not sure is here, but we just got put together. Someone was like, hey, you guys are activist teachers. You should get to know each other. I was doing elementary school, Corey's middle school, Christina's high school, and we were like, okay, we're three. What can we do? And so we started reading about the other cities and what they were doing. And it started as a book club. We all became building reps in our school and started organizing at the school level and had each other as a support team. And then we kept inviting people to our book club and we grew to about seven people consistently. And we were like, hey, that's a steering committee. We now have a steering committee. We are pretty official. And then two things happened that really helped us grow. One was we, as a steering committee, came up with a campaign that we wanted to take out to other schools, and it was a petition campaign to change the way we vote, because we vote in person, and we still vote in person. Our campaign didn't work, but it was a way for us to get out to schools and talk to people and say, like, hey, did you know that we could fight for a better way to vote? Maybe mail-in voting, online voting? I don't know, like, let's fight for this, and that was, one way for us to be proactive and go out and meet people. Another was in uh, 
We had a really cold school campaign happen where over 60 schools didn't have heat one winter break, and when we came back, everyone felt like they were the only school that didn't have heat, and we reached out to all the schools, and we we're like, hey, do you have heat? It turned out 60 schools didn't have heat. And so then we were able to make a statement and change the way the district responds to cold schools. And that was when we saw like, okay, we wanna be proactive and grow slowly, one person at a time at school sites, but then also <laughs> we need to speak out when we see that things aren't going right. And that we were able to start doing more things like Black Lives Matter Week of Action, um, uh, curriculum, speaking out about curriculum, the decline in number of black teachers, and then we decided to run for union leadership. And um, so, what are we focusing on now? And, they won. and, they won. and we won. And we, we are the winners. <laughs> So just to wrap up about what Be More is doing now, we want to continue Be More as a caucus. It's a little confusing now that so many people are in the Baltimore Teachers Union Executive Board and um, becoming staff members, but we do want to continue Be More as a um, proactive um, caucus. We want, we're doing listening tours at schools where we're going around these last two weeks of school and, and going out and listening. We're um, building awareness that building reps elections should be happening at schools and people should be electing their building reps at their schools and we're mobilizing teachers to speak out about this teacher evaluation proposal that's happening and like, changes are happening. And now one thing that we're also doing is talking to other school districts to find out what's happening, what organizing work is going on there, and how can we mobilize and organize across the state of Maryland. So thank you. I don't know how to follow that up. Um, but I will talk about my experience. My name is Nikki Dayrit. I am a second grade teacher at PG County in Hyattsville. Um, I work at a Title I, oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you. I love my babies. But um, I have been, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. I've been working uh, at a Title I school, meaning that m about 70% of our student population gets free and reduced lunch. Um, we are a high English language learner community. We, probably 80% of our students get English language classes. Um, so many of our students come to school with so much trauma on their, so on their shoulders. And I think that there should also be a unifying push to get teachers uh, certified to be you know, trained in mental trauma for young people because a lot of our children are coming from refugee camps. They're coming from across the border. I've had children tell me they, you know, they walked through the desert and their, you know, their parents had to drink water from an animal. And I'm just like, you had to suffer and endure. I had a child that he had PTSD because they kept him, they kept him in a cell for a month by himself. And we have children that are coming to school with these traumas and our school districts feel nothing for them. Our school districts cannot provide the things that our children need emotionally, which comes from us as teachers. Um, a lot of our young people are coming from homes, broken homes that need more healing than we only can provide. And I think that's a unifying thing that we need to talk about is support staff. Um, we need more counselors, more social workers. Um, we need these people to come and help take care of our young people. Um, so many of our financial inequities happen when we start to look at data, the number of scores. Money keeps good, getting poured into schools that have better scores. But what are these standardized tests really? What are they really proving to us? What are they really giving our children? Um, so I think some of the unifying things need to come with um, some grace, need to come with the idea and thought of love and care, because we're dealing with children, we're dealing with young humans. These are people that still have hearts and hope ahead of them, and what can we provide more than just academics? Um, that's something that I've been seeing, and I remember, this is an anecdote from when I participated in a walkout, and we were, all the people that participated in the walkout were punished as teachers. We were told if you do not put in, you know, leave that you left school, then you will get unpaid leave. And it's like, well, you're gonna give me unpaid leave anyway, then do it. What's up? Bring it on. 
Um, but I think that, thank you, um, that's my time. So thank you so much for giving us this platform to talk about the things that matter to us as teachers and the things that we see our children need. Uh, my name is Erica Chavarria. I am a high school Spanish teacher in Howard County. Um, a lot of the work that I've been doing um, in the county is, um, can only be done with community members, with parents, um, and with organizations that have been doing the work already. Um, I'm on the board of Racial Justice Now, uh, which is an organization that started out in Dayton, Ohio, um, which it was um, created by a parent, founded by a parent who was fighting um, systemic racism that seeps through our school system. Um, her three-year-old a uh, little boy had been suspended from preschool multiple times, um, young black child, and um, after doing some research and understanding, she realized that all of the suspensions of pre-K through third grade in Dayton, Ohio, were all black boys, every single one of them. So she founded the organization Racial Justice Now in Dayton, just started doing community organizing, um, and they've recently moved to the DMV chapter, so I'm, I'm, I work in coalition with them, um, as well as another organization out of Howard County called Equity for HC, which is an organization um, that was just recently created where we are attempting to hold the school system accountable for um, criminalizing black and brown kids. Um, those who tend to do the most harm to our um, black and brown kids are the ones that seem to rise up the ranks. Um, instead of being fired, they get promoted. Um, so that's kind of like overall what we're doing. Um, Howard County is interesting because it, it rides on this um, history of the Jim Rouse vision of diversity and equity. And in reality, um, because of that kind of utopian mindset or vision that we think we have, we think we're post-racial, um, we, the county has let some of the most blatant, systemic, systemically racist, blatantly racist, institutionally racist um, uh, things happen through all walks of life in Howard County, education being one of the most affected. And so we are um, incredibly highly segregated. Um, in fact, I think we are the most, a uh, report came out, I think we're the most segregated county in the state, um, which you would never know. So we have some schools in Western Howard County that are almost 100% white. Um, and then we have other schools like the school I teach at, which is majority uh, black and brown students. Um, and uh, overall, we have majority white female teachers. So all of the issues that come with having a majority white female staff um, who are um, who we know don't necessarily believe that all children can learn or have high standards for those kids, um, a lot of um, a lot of the things that come out in our day-to-day -day life is because of that. Um, and also policies that are systemically racist in and of themselves. So one of the, a couple of the things that we're doing, again, with Equity for HC, um, is trying to figure out a way to unify the community, to really do community grassroots organizing around how to hold the school system accountable for the criminalization and oppression of black and brown kids in our schools. Um, we also, um, I ended up meeting all of the amazing Be More folks um, because I was um, at a conference, I believe in Raleigh, uh, North Carolina, for UCORD, which is the national organization. Um, and we really can't talk about union organizing or striking or any of this unless we're talking about um, systemic racism. The, it, we cannot have one without the other. Um, and so one of the things I really admired about the UTLA strikes was that a lot of the language they were including were about um, fighting systemic racism in the schools in, in Los Angeles. Um, random searches of police. We have a, a incredible amount of school resource, they call them school resource officers who are actually cops who can basically do anything they want to kids within a school building. Um, and so part of what we did in Howard County in, in um, along with collaborating with Be More and with nationwide movements is do, we did a Black Lives Matter at School Week of Action as part of the national movement um, in coalition with community uh, members and parents and students. Um, a lot of the issues in Howard County also, unfortunately, we have our local union as a gatekeeper to racial justice work, which is something that we can't talk about unions or union organizing unless we talk about the difficulties um, when you have that happening within your local unions as well. Um, and. And so we had a Black Lives Matter at School Week of Action as part of the national movement. Um, a lot of what came out of that, we had a resolution. The community came together and wrote a resolution for our local board to um, pass a Black Lives Matter at School Week of Action resolution through the board. Um, so that was a big success. We had students organizing for events in school. Um, and so 
a lot of the work again is is linking what we're striking for. We seem to separate bread and butter issues with everything else. And we have to realize that fighting oppression and fighting all the systemic racist challenges that we're fighting is part of bread and butter issues. Um, when you're looking at testing, when you're looking at staffing, when you're looking at class size, all of that is intertwined. And so we can't separate the two. So that's a little bit of what we're doing in Howard County and kind of where I'm coming from. Thank you. Hello. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Lisa Torres. I teach in Cecil County, Maryland, and um, I've been an activist for uh, women's rights and um, undocumented workers for a while, but I haven't, you know, organized in a union. So it was a totally different experience, and meeting Be More folks and UCOR was just, um, I, I don't know, the words can't come to me because it was inspirational. I went into school with a lot of um, support from, from them, just knowing all that they did. So the um, solidarity that I got when you know I did um, actions for Black Lives Matter and got pulled into the admin office and you know they pulled out the Comar book and they were going through everything, you know, really didn't phase me because I was like, no, there are other teachers doing this. So. I'm going to stand my ground, and I'm going to continue doing the work that I did, you know. And it it means so much with the kids and the student population because they see that they're not alone. And in a small town, th the reason why I bring this up is because it's a rural town in Cecil County, and you know there are a lot of conservative people up there, mm -hmm. so you get pushed back every which way. And but the little things that you do inspire your students, inspire other teachers, and you, you do make a difference. So what we're doing is we did two study groups on uh, the book Teaching for Black Lives. We had Delaware teachers come out, we had Maryland teachers come out, um, and we're trying to form a group there to be more um, organized so that way we can support, be more, um, more efficiently. And the most support I, I, I get is from community members. When I talk to parent advocates, um, they are full on in support of, you know, the social justice initiatives and the environmental concerns that we have in Cecil County. So I have definitely learned a lot from organizing with Be More folks, meeting up with UCOR and um, other labor organizers. So that's just my experience. I'm gonna stop there because I think I'm at two minutes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sharon Alkali. I'm a special education teacher with Baltimore County. Um, I've been a special education teacher for about 12 years, and I'm coming from New York. I was in the UFT for about 10 years, and now I'm in the TABCO union. Um, and I'm also a DSA member, and I'd like to... <laughs> yeah. We have done uh, a lot of... Um, support work for Be More and Seed, and I, we have been so inspired by what they've done, and just the the rising up of the rank and file in Be More has been really, really inspiring. Um, part of what I just to kind of reiterate on what um, Erica was talking about a little bit in the special education, what I see um, is that a different way of criminalizing Black and Brown children is. Um, labeling them as having disabilities. Um, and what that means is that children who are coming from areas that are, where they have limited resources or they have limited access to, um, you know, food and their, their housing insecure and all these, all these other kinds of social factors, I think that really impacts on how we label children and how we treat children in the schools. Um, and I think that really needs to change. So I'm, I just found out today that I'm going to be part of a um, a working group within the TABCO Union, um, specializing in special education resources and pushing for more special edu special education um, resources in the school, but also analyzing how we 
how we define special education in the schools. Um, and I think that's really important because this is, this is another way in which we segregate our schools. Um, and also, um, there is a number of special, educator, special educators who are organizing around how we, how we treat teachers because um, we have a federal mandate to provide a free and appropriate public, public education, but often we aren't doing that because um, we can't provide individualized education to many students because we have this, uh, we have these high levels of, of sort of like oversight of teachers and these, this like constant testing which becomes almost like an abuse of teachers and abuse of students. Um, and because of that, we're not providing individualized education. And as a socialist, I really feel like we need more democratic um, management of our schools. Teachers should be in charge of the schools, not in, well, <laughs> teachers, I, I think teachers should run everything, but <laughs> um, I think teachers and communities need to formulate their curriculum based on what their communities need, rather than some bureaucrats in the government who, have nev who don't have education degrees and who don't know what they're talking about. So <laughs> I, that's, that's my spiel, so um, <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Hi, my name is Christina Duncan Evans, and I'm a member of Be More. Um, I, can we just give it up one more time for this panel? They're really incredible. Yes. Um, so I am not a lifelong Marylander. I was born in Washington, D.C., um, but I was born spitting distance from Hyattsville, uh, so I think I, I consider myself to have grown up in Hyattsville. I currently live in Baltimore City, and as for Cecil County, I don't stop when I'm driving because, <laughs> <laughs> woo, I've had one... Those cops are terrifying. Um, so this brings me to think about statewide organizing, right? Because what we saw in so many states was a like broad movement that uh, captured so many thousands of educators. Um, and can we see educators raise your hand one more time? Okay, um, can you raise your hand if you're an AFT? American Federation of Teachers. Raise your hand if you're an NEA, National Education Association. All right, so. I want to explain one of the barriers to statewide organizing is that Baltimore City is American Federation of Teachers and everywhere else is in EA. And so if you think about the narratives about how special and unique and corrupt and broken Baltimore City is, we are, are living within structures that kind of exacerbate that divide. So my first question for our panelists, and I do want to state my question then maybe just set some guidelines so we get through as many questions as possible. Um, so the question I'd like you to ponder on for a second is what are the issues that you really see have the potential to ha become statewide issues? What are the issues that you really unite us as educators and support personnel across the state? Um, and as they think about it, I'm going to ask that like two or three of our panelists chime in. Um, for my part, I'm going to try to touch on two or three pre-generated questions and then turn it over to audience members because I've seen people, I see your, the thoughts going across your head. I know that you have some questions for um, our panelists here. Um, and so with that, um, I'm curious to hear what you guys think about the issues that have the potential to really impact uh, our, act, our activism and our organizing on a statewide level. Um, everything. Um, I think, I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind is, um, well, actually, I think it's probably a good time to bring up what I had spoken about on the phone, but there was a recent ruling by the Labor Relations Board um, that, I don't know if it's out in the open, but I'm about to put it out in the open, so... Um, it uh, basically the the ruling what it had to do I'm not going to go into the minute details but it had to do with a um, a case in Washington County um, and the the ruling of this of the labor relations board basically is putting um, bargaining for salaries as a illegal subject of bargaining so so school boards can now interpret the ruling that was just made in Washington County as that 
educators are salaried, are hourly employees, and therefore bargaining your salary would be an illegal subject of bargaining. So that is something that just happened um, not too long ago, like within the past month or so. Um, I feel like part of the issue that, I don't think that Maryland has gotten to the point where we have a, there hasn't been like a urgency. Like I think in other states there was, it was building and building and building. And yeah, we have, we're, you know, billions of dollars owed to students that haven't, or owed to education that hasn't been there, but there hasn't been like this major urgency. I think that may be one of the factors that can push towards this urgency. Um, of, of statewide organizing. Um, I think the second thing would definitely be um, just the, the, the criminalization of kids. I'm not gonna stop saying it. Um, the way that our students are treated, the way that black and brown students are treated, cops in schools is a huge problem. Um, no, no pushing forward of true restorative justice. Um, I think those are unifying issues as long as we can all come to some sort of understanding, but this, the, the racism that seeps through it is, is, a, is a dividing factor, but I, I think that's mm -hmm. I would just add another unifying issue, um, teacher retention. I know that teachers are just leaving the profession every year, and, uh, and in Baltimore City, it's like a revolving door of teachers. As long as there's a name listed on the roster for every classroom, that's all that's important, and it's not much is done to retain quality veteran teachers. So I think that would be an issue across school districts in Maryland. Go ahead. Oh. Um, I remember from our phone conference, we talked about the issue of uh, equity in terms of resource sharing um, and how uh, typically the way that Maryland has, or I, I know from Montgomery County and PG County, typically the money goes to schools that have scored certain scores on their school reports. So depending on your score on your school report, that is how much money is allocated to your school. And so when that happens, schools that are underperforming, schools that are already having trouble sustaining the population they do have are the ones that get hit the hardest budgetary, uh, budgetary wise. Um, so I think that the equity of resources is definitely something that we can as well rally around because we know that the schools that are often the ones left out in the cold are the ones that cater to our students most in need. That actually is a really wonderful segue to my next question which is about equity. Um, and I think that uh, there was a comment earlier that there's a lot of bad news going around and there's a lot of issues you can organize around. Um, when it comes to education, one of the interesting things about how uh, screwed the pooch is, is that every time resources are distributed, they are distributed inequitably. So you can find equity issues within a single classroom. You can find equity issues at a school level. You can find equity issues system-wide across schools. So with so many equity issues pushing in at different levels of the system, how do we marshal people to be unified to take organized action together? Yeah, so uh, we all marched on, I think a lot of us marched on Annapolis back a couple of months ago, and we won quite a lot of money. Baltimore County won $1.68 billion in funding. Um, but we know that those resources are not going to be allocated in, or distributed in an equitable fashion. And I think what we really need is to follow what, or to follow the model of Be More um, and develop rank and file within our unions because we, we often don't know where that money is going. Um, but I think that has to happen on a mass scale. I heard bargaining for the common good. Was I, yeah? Okay, yeah. Does anyone know what bargaining for the common good is? Yeah, maybe. It's basically, um, in, a, in a nutshell, um, it is forcing, um, it, it, it's collective bargaining, but community-wide. So the community has a stake, the community has a say um, in what issues are going to be bargained. You can bargain for all sorts of things. It's not just salaries or, or, or the bread and butter issues, but um, you have states that are organizing around um, restorative justice being implemented in all schools. You have 
um, organizing in Minneapolis. They were they they did a lot of or St. Paul. I'm sorry, St. Paul, Minnesota. They did bargaining for the common good or the community. They had they had uh, partnered with the local Black Lives Matter um, chapter and were doing um, all sorts of bargaining around racial justice work. So way to to do equity work is you have to work with the community and and have the community involved in the bargaining. Um, so that the districts feel pressure to make sure that the resources are distributed equitably. I mean, one other thing is that was mentioned by Eric is that this is a woman-driven uh, industry, and yet, you know, I don't know about your districts, but we get three weeks for maternity leave, and that's not paid, and then and then we have to pay taxes back. So like I knew a woman who took three weeks and then she came into work and didn't get paid the first two weeks she worked. So like maternity leave <laughs> would be great. I know New York just got six months of maternity leave. So I mean, that's something worth fighting for um, in, a, in a woman driven industry. But yeah, I think people, especially teachers get fired up because they, they want to hold students accountable and this boggles my mind you know like when when teachers aren't involved in holding the administration or our government officials accountable but they want to hold students so accountable yet students have role models that are not accountable <laughs> so but teachers want to hold people accountable so yeah if we hold our board accountable to you know fix lead in our water instead of you know building a turf that's going to pollute the ground and and therefore pollute our water system you know what i mean just common sense negotiations, yeah, I think would definitely work. Do you want to give a comment, Natalia? No, thank you. Okay, cool. Um, so for my last uh, question, I'd love to hear from each person one sentence. Um, nationwide, when we think about the live labor movement big picture, the, the word is solidarity. And I think in my own local union experience, um, solidarity has been a word that has ki been kind of elusive. And um, I've, I, there have been times when I really questioned whether um, my union brothers and sisters as a whole had a concept of what solidarity means in the traditional labor sense. At the same time, on this panel, within this conversation, we've heard people talk about their inspiration from each other, and that to me sounds a little bit like solidarity. I want to know, and my question is, what does solidarity look like, or what does solidarity feel like? Um, what does it look like in a real practical sense, and what does it feel like if you are experiencing it? Um. Well, like example this week, right across the street, the BSO musicians are locked out and are fighting. And so Be More reached out and asked, like, how can we support? How can we show solidarity? And they're like, can you amplify our message? Can you share our Facebook page? Can you come out? and just hang out on the picket line with us. Can you take pictures and send it? I know from um, strikes that have been going on across the country, those solidarity pictures really lift people's spirits. If they see you and a group of friends like got together and said like, be more supports your strike, that that really lifts their spirits and is a way to easily show solidarity with other um, people who are striking. And we should all go across the street and have solidarity with the, the musicians. Um, I think with all the strife around us, I think one of the biggest parts of solidarity is civility. Um, I think that you know, for a very long time that civility as a movement for all of us together being in one accord, being able to, to treat each other equally and, and with respect. I think that if we can begin to foster that within the younger generation as well, um, as teachers, that's what we always expect, that's what we're always thinking is them, you know, the children, the future, what's gonna happen for them. Um, and I think that when we think solidarity, oneness, togetherness, we have to start with teaching our young people civility. You know, they're out there hurting each other because they don't get the opportunity to talk about their feelings. They don't get the opportunity to actually sit and ponder their action or their thoughts before they act. You know, that wait time that we think about so critically as a teacher, we don't give them wait time in life. 
And often enough times, that wait time is that snap second before they commit something wrong or before they hurt themselves or, you know, without thinking. It's because we didn't give them, you know, the wait time in life. We, we pressured them so much through the school system and the systems around us that are built to oppress us. We think about all the pressure that young people face today and the biggest crux of it all is are we teaching them civility? Are we teaching them how to be civil to one another, even on a basic human level of respect? We don't give them the opportunity, I don't think. And I think that's something that, in solidarity, we need, we need more civility. I teach Spanish and my students did a project on the strikes across the country um, and had to report on big nice posters about what they thought about the strikes across the country, student strikes, teacher strikes, everything strikes. And um, they did a video message to this teacher striking in UTLA uh, that said, estamos con ustedes. Was that one sentence? Yeah. <laughs> so involving students in the solidarity, like I'm all about the kids. Um, power in motion, right? Like being, having your feet on the ground and working with people for the same cause. That's, that's solidarity to me. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just, I never considered myself a socialist until I became a teacher. And I really saw an injury to one is really an injury to all. And my, my first supervisor had cancer. We organized for her to give her our sick days. And my, my boss would not, I almost got fired for it. But in that moment, I realized that there was nothing greater than solidarity. So, yeah. um, So with our remaining time, we've got time for probably uh, a couple of audience questions. Um, I will pass one mic out here if anyone would like to come up and ask a question, and then we can have one mic rotating throughout the, the folks on the panel. Um, so if you'd like to uh, raise up that question, you can come up and meet me at the mic. Hello, thank you all for being here. Um, so my question is that um, there's been a lot of talk about basically like social emotional learning and restorative practices and um, equitable curriculum that really is culturally responsive. Um, and all of that is like clearly obvious and important and beautiful. How uh, do you think it can, should, be legislated or will that make it like stupid and flat and horrifying and um, somehow twist get twisted to serve the boss's needs great questions um, I don't know maybe no I'm not sure what do you guys <laughs> you, you guys want to answer you answer I think anytime bureaucrats get involved with children's minds and lives, that it often takes away from their true purpose of giving that gift to them. Um, in my classroom, we do meditation every single day, and I have seen such a decrease in their emotional responses to rage, to anger. Uh, they have more patience, they have more focus. I have had students, when we did a meditation session uh, right after lunch, and she said, I need to have a conversation with you and my friend because we're having an issue, we're making slime, and I need you to mediate. I was like, whoa, you're in second grade. <laughs> you just asked me to mediate a conflict between you, and you're using your words? This is amazing. And I think if we were able to give that time to children to, it, it, we meditate 10, 15 minutes. That is nothing compared to the benefits you receive in your classroom from giving that time to them. Um, and I think that, that you know, just seeing the proof in, in the year's worth of work, like my children believe they can move the weather. They believe they can move anything with the power of their mind. And to me, that is the greatest gift. Like I had students who couldn't read when they, who couldn't speak 
when they came into my class. But because of the power of their mind and the skill of focus and perseverance that they've gotten through social emotional learning, through culturally responsive teaching, the relationships that they're building in class, I have seen so much improvement. And I think if you legislate that, that takes a big part of the heart and soul of it. And you know, if we're trying to give them back parts that have been taken away by oppressive systems, I don't think oppressive systems should get involved. I actually had a conversation with a teacher today about restorative practices because it's being implemented in Cecil County kind of late. Um, go figure. But um, this teacher is really skeptical about whether it's going to work. And I was having this conversation. He's like, oh, well, you know, I think the administration is just going to treat it like PBIS, which is positive behavior sports. Right? And I'm like, you know what? They fucking are. <laughs> you know? I'm like, fuck. You know? And it, it, it has to come from the bottom up, you know, for teachers that really are doing the work because the administration, the, the politicians don't do the work. They don't know what it is to implement that and have that experience that you were talking about, you know? So, yeah, I don't. I say give us the money and leave us the hell alone. <laughs> Uh. Hi, um, first of all, I'm just like humbled and in awe of everyone on the stage, so thank you. Um, I live here, my family lives in Chicago. I've been f like following the fact that some of the charter schools have organized and striked in Chicago, uh, the first one at the beginning of the year and then four in February. And um, I don't work in the field, but I'm like pretty sus of charter schools and want investment in our public education. And I'm just wondering what you all feel about charter schools turning to unions and what that strike environment is like and your response to that. So I want to give a little bit of background on charter law because charter law varies state to state, which is why Arizona has a ridiculous charter law that like leads to a lot of corruption and abuse. Um, Maryland's charter law looks really different from Illinois and uh, Arizona. In Maryland, um, we have something called a single charter authorizer, which basically means the only people who can authorize a charter school are the school district itself. And so if the school district starts a charter school, that school remains a part of the public school system. The only entity other than a local school district that can start a charter school is the State Board of Education. So only government can start charter schools. That's different in a lot of other places where independent and pr even private commissions can start pr charter schools, which again reduces oversight. Um, the other piece where charter schools in Maryland are really different from other places is that in charter schools in Maryland, all of the employee, all the certificated employees, all the teachers who are teaching children, teachers of record, um, are supposed to be uh, school district employees and members of the same union that traditional schools are a part of. So Be More was started by Natalia and me and Corey, and Corey is a charter school teacher, right? And so charter schools um, here in Maryland have not caused the like flashpoints of controversy um, that they have in other places. That does not mean that we are exist in an equitable system where resources are divided equally among traditional schools and charter schools. We still have some digging to do, um, but our digging with charter schools is really in the nooks and crannies of like how this money is being distributed because there is a lack of transparency, but it looks different here than it does in other places. Other things to add? I would, um, if you really want to see what's happening, the destruction of, of, of public education turned to New Orleans. Um, they used the uh, De the the natural and also government imposed disaster in New Orleans to um, wipe out communities. Um, it was essentially genocide, and then use that as a way to completely destroy public education. Now there is are no public schools in New Orleans. Um, so in that case, when you're talking about teachers striking, if the only teachers are charter teachers, um, then what else? What other option is there, right? Um, I also, I, I'm, I'm against charters in general, um, but I also think it's really important to not, um, to not blame or, or target families and, and parents, um, but really when we're talking about charters to be really aware of, of, the, um, of who you're talking to and, and what knowledge is out there about what's happening. 
Um, but definitely, and Puerto Rico is on the same path. So we, if you want to know what's going on with charters, definitely turn to New Orleans, definitely turn to Puerto Rico. But talking about solidarity, the New Orleans folks and the Puerto Rico folks and a lot of um, other organizations, Chicago, the Journey for Justice Alliance, there is a huge coalition, an alliance, not even a coalition, we're talking an alliance of folks that are fighting um, what, what is happening with charters and other things. But, but that's, talk about solidarity, that is a huge one. Journey for Justice Alliance, look it up. Um, so can we give a round of applause to our panelists and also to Red Emma's for hosting this event? I'm gonna pass it back to our author to close this out. Cool. Yeah, so first of all, um, thanks everyone for coming. Thanks for all the panelists for coming. I, I think it was really great to try to combine book talk with organizing, right? So hopefully you all came away with a sense of the struggle that's happening locally. And please stick around afterwards to find out how you can support more. And then also if you wanna get a copy of the book, um, I'm actually donating all the funds from my end uh, to a strike fund. So definitely get a copy and I'll sign it in front. So I think that will be up here in front. There'll be books. And thanks everyone for coming. That was it. Um, thanks to Red Emma's and to everyone else. Give yourselves a round of applause.